Uh, and I have to congratulate everybody who's uh, come with me this far. It's, it's been quite a journey through the Lotus Sutra. And uh, well, what I first want to do is begin the, the liturgy uh, for opening the sutra and then begin the talk. So the unsurpassed and profound and sublime Dharma is difficult to encounter, even in a billion eons. Today, we receive here and uphold it, vowing to fathom to the true meaning of the Tathagata. So <clears throat> today I'm going to talk about chapters 21 and 22. That's, that's where we are. And these are not the final chapters of the Lotus Sutra um, in the way that we read the Lotus Sutra today, but many scholars believe that there was a time when these were the final chapters. And the following chapters, the chapters 20 through, through 28, were later interpolations. They were added, you know, later editions. So as I mentioned in the past, I'm comfortable with a scholarly analysis of the sutra, which look, looks at its contextuality as a religious document that displays cultural bias, ideological disputes, um, and, and a variety of other cultural kinds of um, phenomena. But I'm probably more comfortable, I'm definitely more comfortable discussing it as the words of the Buddha, the true words, which aim at our liberation and self-transformation. So I think both viewpoints can be helpful, but for at least, um, for at the very least, they, they help us understand uh, the structure and, you know, in quotes, the, the plot of the sutra. And the sutra, of course, is not a novel or a play, but it does have something of a narrative structure. And, and that, that helps convey um, the meaning, the understanding, the practice to us. So it's helpful to be aware of it so we can look even deeper into the sutra. And I will be discussing some of the literary conventions, um, if you will, and some of the way that some of the ways that the sutra is put together. Now, I, I want to catch everyone up to, to some extent, even though there's a lot has gone on. Um, and after, after tw chapter 22, I won't really have to do this because the, the, the final um, six chapters uh, are really standalone. I mean, they're, they're certainly based on, on the Lotus Sutra, what's come before, but they're not uh, as tied in um, as these final chapters are, and of course, all the preceding ones are. So where we are now, we've gone far beyond the first half of the sutra, the first 14 chapters, which are known as the trace sections, which enumerate what Dao Sheng, the 13th, uh, the third century Chinese monk described as the causes, you know, the, way, uh, the way that things begin, the way that we begin to understand the practice. And, and those causes are um, that there's one vehicle, um, that uh, we will all reach Buddhahood and all of this will be conveyed and we will learn this through expedient means. This is really the, the major thrust of the, the first half of the sutra. And um, now we're, we're firmly in the foundational uh, teachings, the, you know, the bun um, in Chinese, what Dao, Dao Shang called the effects section, which, um, are usually described as starting in chapter 15, where bodhisattva mahasattvas that we never encountered before emerge from the earth. And we start to understand the significance and the implications of this rather spectacular event. But I have said earlier that um, in my view and perhaps some others that things really start changing in chapter 10, the teachers of the Dharma, where there's really um, a new transition away from these first three teachings, away from those uh, emphasis on um, the, uh, the one vehicle will all be Buddhas and expedient means. And it starts to um, reveal the, the effects by showing the effectiveness of the sutra as embodied in teachers of the Dharma. And, um, and then we hear 
something which we've actually heard right, right from the beginning, but how anyone who encounters the sutra in a meaningful way um, will be on the Buddha path. And then this, this trend um, also continues in the spectacular chapter, chapter 11, with the rising of this enormous jeweled stupa from the earth, um, where uh, Shakyamuni, um, and, uh, who is the historical Buddha, seemingly, and Prabhuta Ratna, who is a, uh, maybe an Adi Buddha, uh, you know, a, a universal Buddha, as our understanding is at this chapter, they meet. So the, the historical and the universal are um, one. And we're sort of in a, in a position of, of non-dualistic non understanding. Um, time, space, um, concept, actuality, all, all, everything is, um, is connected, is unified. So, um, so then uh, um, there, there are some other, obviously, chapters, this 12, 13, and 14, which, which start, which reinforce a lot of um, what we've learned in chapter 10, but then it's chapter 15. Um, and I was going to say, I was tempted to say all hell breaks loose, but in this case would be more like all heaven breaks loose. And, and I guess that wouldn't be correct either, since um, it's where all the bodhisattvas have come from all over the universe. And this is really, we get a sense beyond the six realms of existence. These are the bodhisattva mahasattvas, um, um, thoroughly enlightened beings, not quite a Buddhas yet, but Buddhas also um, from um, all the quarters and manifestation, transformation bodies of the Buddha also um, come to this place in the sky. So the, the stupa has risen into the air and the uh, human assembly has ma magically been uh, lifted so they could see and encounter the Buddhas. And this um, level of where, where the stupa is rising into the, into the ether, into the sky, uh, continues until chapter 22 when it comes back to earth. So there's, a, there's kind of a cycle that we're, we're going to look at. And um, so when, um, when we're in chapter 15, the, uh, the, the Buddha wants to reveal the wisdom of all, all the Buddhas. And uh, he, he, uh, he shows that, or he tells that when all of these uh, Buddhas and Bodhisattvas who come from all the different quarters, really in, in, um, in chapter 11 with, uh, with the uh, rising of the stupa, and I, you know, I realize as I'm, I'm talking about this, it's kind of funny, as if I'm, I'm discussing a novel, which this really isn't, but, but for point of reference, you, know, you have to sort of say what, what event happens and another event happens. Um, otherwise, it sort of sounds like a, a cliff, cliffhanger or you know, some um, movie with one sequel after another. And, and this is kind of what we're, we're tied to when we, we have to discuss things in, um, in our general, ordinary, linguistic kind of way. So anyway, the, the, um, the, these uh, bodhisattvas that have come from all over the universe um, tell the Buddha that they would like to, to preach the, the Lotus Sutra. They want to, to learn, um, uphold, recite, um, copy, transcribe, uh, every, everything that is involved in helping sentient beings. And the Buddha politely says, jur in Chinese, stop. Now we, um, and he's not saying you're not needed, but he, what he shows is that there are bodhisattvas and mahasattvas who have been training for millennia um, within, within the earth, within the Saha world. And they emerge and we meet, we meet the four leaders, um, the most uh, prominent of, of which is um, Shang Xing or um, superior conduct. And so, and when, when, um, when all of these events start to happen and uh, the, the bodhisattvas uh, 
who have come from other places, look at all these new bodhisattvas that they've never seen before. They say, wait a second, this doesn't make any sense. Um, you, the Buddha, um, reached enlightenment maybe 40 years ago. How could you have possibly been teaching bodhisattvas and mahasattvas for untold millennia? And then what, um, and that really is a cliffhanger. <laughs> at the end of chapter 15, it's kind of what's going on? And then in chapter 16, it's revealed that um, the expedient means, which is something that has um, uh, transpired throughout the sutra, you know, even from the, the light uh, emitting from the Buddha's urna, um, the line, the tuft of hair between his forehead, which begins the sutra, that's kind of an expedient meaning as far as I'm concerned. But the, the Buddha explains that this, um, incredible expedient means is really that um, he didn't attain enlightenment um, in, in, in the Deer Park, as all of the early sutras say. He was, he attained enlightenment um, in untold number of eons and kalpas earlier. And it also is revealed that, that his parinirvana, when he seemed to, to die, to pass away, when he was 80 years old was also an expedient means. So the, the, the Buddha as utterly outside and inside of time and space is revealed in chapter 16. And um, so then let's see, we, um, we have a, a number of chapters obviously I covered in the last uh, few months that that show the, um, the benefit of accepting this new teaching with especially accepting it with joy. And we see that um, in chapter 19, that the teacher of, of the uh, Lotus Sutra, a true teacher of the Lotus Sutra uh, gains all of these enhancements to their senses in the uh, understanding that this, the senses are becoming purified. They're originally all purified. Our minds are, um, are pure and luminous, but we ordinary sentient beings conditioned as we are don't know that. And we are caught um, in our own traps. You know, we are continually um, stepping on our own feet, so to speak, in, in subtle and profound ways. So last time I, I, I spoke about uh, um, Chang Bu Jing, never disparaging. Uh, who is the uh, an earlier incarnation of Shakyamuni himself, who has nothing but compassion and praise for all sentient beings. And he kind of embodies the entire Lotus Sutra. So that was really a remarkable chapter where he is kind of like the, um, uh, the Dharmakaya itself, in my estimation. I, I don't think you can say anything um, anything less than that when you really, really look deeply into the chapter. So um, now um, I'm going to do a, a very um, quick summary of the, these two chapters I'm gonna to discuss today. And then I'm gonna drill down into the, uh, into the issues and some, some ways that we can look even deeper into the sutra. So here we are, it's um, chapter 21. It's the Mimi Shen Tong Jirli the supernatural powers of the Tathagata, uh, Rulai, right? So like in chapter 15, innumerable bodhisattvas and mahasattvas appear, um, uh, but um, these, the, these are the, the bodhisattvas that were deep in, in, this, in the Saha world and emerged from the earth. And these bodhisattvas and mahasattvas, like the group from, you know, from uh, all around the universe, so to speak, pledge to um, uphold and uh, teach the sutra. And here the Buddha takes them up on it. Um, now, this is the, the, the overriding image in this particular chapter is what I'm about to describe to you. And once they've pledged themselves to the Buddha, the Buddha then displays his supernatural powers. I mean, he displays, displays them in a particular way. 
So he and the other assembled Buddhas extend their broad tongues upward till they reach the Buddha heavens. And from all the pores, their pores, and it's not clear in the sutra whether it's pores in their the tongue, the holes in their skin, or perhaps the, pore, the pores throughout their body, they emit immeasurable countless beams of light that illuminate all the worlds uh, in the 10 directions. And I, you can take this as kind of the Buddha's acknowledgement of the dedication of all the bodhisattvas and mahasattvas. So this particular event of the, the extended tongues of the Buddha, that lasts for a hundred thousand years or hundreds of thousands of years, depending on the translation. Then they draw back their tongues. They all cough in unison and together they snap their fingers, all one sound. And these sounds made by the two actions fill all the Buddha worlds in the 10 directions and the earth through um, and all the, the lands quake in six different ways. And um, so, and then the living beings of every description uh, because of the super Buddha's supernatural power see innumerable Buddhas seated on lion thrones beneath jewel trees. And they see uh, Shakyamuni and uh, Prabhutarata, um, uh, many treasures, Bao. Buddhas sitting in the lion's throne in, in the jeweled stupa, which is still in the air. They are filled with great awe in what they had never seen before. And then the heavenly beings in the sky announce that Shakyamuni Buddha is in the Saha world, which is very distant, and has proclaimed the great vehicle called the Lotus Sutra, the Wonderful Law. And everyone is told to respond with great joy and do obeisance to the Buddha. And these beings hail Shakyamuni Buddha. Their offerings are turned into a jeweled curtain that completely covers the area where the Buddhas are. And then all the worlds in the, in the 10 directions are connected such that there is one Buddha land. And this happened in chapter seven. Um, everyone can see everyone else. It's kind of a, a real um, image of interconnectivity, almost like something you'd find in the Avatam Saka Sutra. Then the Buddha proclaims that the benefits of the sutra are indescribable and inexhaustible. He declares um, that this sutra contains all of his doctrines, his supernatural powers, the storehouse of his essential secrets, and the most profound matters that are proclaimed, revealed, and clearly expounded. Um, so uh, the Buddha states these teachings must be broadly practiced expounded and taught after his extinction. And wherever it is taught, the area should be recognized as holy and stupas built and offerings made because in such places, the Buddhas have achieved Anuttara Samyak Sambodhi, highest um, perfect enlightenment. And they have turned the Dharma wheel and they have achieved Parinirvana. And then in the verse section, uh, the Buddha declares that anyone who can uphold the sutra will see the Buddha, have no obstructions. And such a person, this is a direct quote from the verse section, as bright light of the sun and moon can clear away all darkness and obscurity. So this man going through the world can extinguish the darkness of beings. And then it says all doubts will be removed and he will attain the Buddha way. Now, Jur E, the sixth uh, uh, century uh, Tian Tai master, declared that this sutra that I just summarized and the next one called Entrustment were really um, aimed at the future. And of course, um, the Japanese um, teacher Nichiren, Nichiren really ran with that as um, showing the importance of these particular chapters. And, and I'm going over them because if you read the sutra just um, in a cursory manner, it's very easy for your mind to glaze over. You read some of these kind of extraordinary facts and one may not on a first glance see the point of it. So, and that's what I'm going to address. And then let me do a very quick um, summary of, it's a very short chapter really of entrustment, um, which is um, uh, Jule, 
right? entrust to entrust to lay responsibility on, and 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 this theme of entrusting and and telling people to um, study and learn and propagate the sutra has been continuing throughout all of the chapters. So the Buddha rises from his dharma seat and using his central powers with his right hand, he pats the heads of innumerable bodhisattvas and mahasattvas. And, and remember, this is um, millions and billions and trillions of, of bodhisattvas and mahasattvas have emerged from, from the earth with their retinue, with all of their followers, which also number um, eight times the, uh, the, the number of grains in, in the, uh, of sand in the Ganges. And then he tells them how infinite long he's practiced this rare doctrine of supreme awakening. And he says to them, you should wholeheartedly disseminate this Dharma, making its benefits spread everywhere. The Buddha talks about his compassion and that he's not begrudge, begrudging with his teaching and neither should any of his dis disciples be stingy. And uh, he's able to bestow on living beings the wisdom of the Buddha, the wisdom of the thus come one, the wisdom that comes of itself. And that's um, Tsuran Jirhui. And I can understand why many translators have had difficulty in translating and others. Natural wisdom, um, inside or outside the sutras, well, hard to say. So in future ages, these teachings should be shared with those of faith. For those who do not have faith, the Buddha has other profound doctrines that will help them. And I think that's really an important um, thing to note here, because many times in the sutra, the Buddha declared that the sutra is utterly um, supreme. Um, no one should study any other sutra but the Lotus Sutra. But of course, the Lotus Sutra contains all of the other sutras. And many times the Buddha talks about how he will expediently teach uh, the Shravakas, the Pratyeka Buddhas, the Bodhisattvas, anyone um, who, according to their capacity, wishes to go and embark on the Buddha way. The Buddha says that he will do that. Um, but he's, he's not being um, doctrinaire here. And in, in chapter uh, 20, which we uh, talked about uh, last week, uh, um, Chang Bu Jing, never disparaging, does not read sutras. He doesn't study. He is just um, utterly um, wisdom and compassion, uh, demonstrating it by his um, observance and kindness towards all sentient beings. So the Lotus Sutra in a way um, transcends itself. And, uh, and with the one vehicle, as I've uh, said earlier, it's kind of mind itself. It's, it's beyond any kind of description, but it is something very, very worthy of, of discussion. And uh, before I get into now the more in-depth analysis, just want to remark that Thich Nhat Hanh proposed that there's kind of a third section of the Lotus Sutra. We have the, um, the trace, the, the beginning cause, um, the early 14 chapters, and then the more fundamental one in the final chapters. But Thich Nhat Hanh says that perhaps in chapter 20, with uh, the um, uh, description and um, um, understanding that we, we get from meeting, never disparaging. That's the action section of the, the Lotus Sutra when the teachings are actually um, employed and put into use. So now let's, let's like look deeper into what we've just talked about and um, you know, not let anything get past us. So supernatural powers, what does that mean, right? Um, Simply, they're things that we can't ordinarily do. Uh, we may think that somebody who uh, plays an instrument better or plays tennis better than, than us might have su somewhat supernatural powers, but we would, really wouldn't use it for that. It's, it's really something extraordinary, something that inspires awe and wonder. And supernatural powers are talked about in the Pali Ken, in the early teachings, um, and I, I'm sure many have heard of things like being able to fly, passing through walls, being able to read minds, 
various kinds of supernatural powers. And in the Pali Canon, they are spoken about very matter of factly when one has settled one's mind and certain, achieved a certain level of samadhi, then this is a very natural process. And I, I think it's important to note that we may think that some of the things that we've seen here are supernatural, but um, this is kind of all in a day's work for a Buddha. And drilling down even further, I, I think that you can look at um, the real meaning of a supernatural power is expedient means the way to reach sentient beings with the Buddha's teaching. That is a supernatural um, teaching, as is, um, I've uh, heard this as well, um, one of the great miracles of Buddhism is the Four Noble Truths themselves. That's, that's a miracle, that's supernatural. And, and perhaps um, the, the, the real supernatural and natural power is clarity of mind, ordinary mind, seeing things as they are. So now as I look further into the sutra, and I'm going to start to look at how we perceive some of the things that are going on in the sutra, just want to bring up uh, this um, American uh, expert in, in uh, media who in the 60s and 70s was very famous. Um, he was widely read. His name was Marshall McLuhan. And his most famous statement is the medium is the message. Um, by which he means that the important thing about media is not the messages they carry, but the way the medium itself affects human consciousness and society at large. And this is a very um, mundane example, but in other words, owning a TV that we watch is more significant than anything we watch, John. It's, it's a certain statement about just owning a, a TV. And there's a certain measure of that in, in studying the sutra. And averting our attention to the sutra and, and trying our best to understand it and being as honest as we can, noting that the things that we don't understand um, are simply stepping stones to our eventual understanding. And, and then from, a, a, it's interesting, from a media um, message for marketing, um, the, the, me, the medium is the message shows that the way the message is delivered is strongly influenced by the channel through which it is transmitted. Once again, the Lotus Sutra creates a particular environment. And it makes me think of, there's an Eskimo word or Inuit word as we would say now for a storyteller. And, and I certainly don't want to reduce these um, by Puglia, great sutras to stories, but they do have plot and context, as I said. But the Inuit word for a storyteller is the one who creates an environment in which the truth is revealed. And I think that is what the Lotus Sutra does. It is creating this environment that is understandable and beyond our understanding. And I think we can become comfortable with where we are. So then in, in, in the Lotus Sutra and other sutras, it mentions the, um, the expedient means. And there are um, nine kinds of expedient means that the Lotus Sutra mentions. And I'm just gonna mention them really briefly because they're, most of them are, are in, in the sutra. And once again, it's helpful to become aware of kind of how the teachings are imparted to look look at the language right even though we're trying to see beyond the language we're always looking for the 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 um the principle which is um beyond con conceptions beyond senses beyond words and phrases but the words and phrases are what convey this to us or point the way that we can look into ourselves, turn the light around and um, come to realization eventually, you know, gradually on our particular paths, according to our, um, you know, our abilities. So there are suttas, which we, we all know about. Um, there are um, uh, basically a technical current, a, a, a sutta that incorporates verse, agata, 
I, I spoke about the um, Veya uh, Karana in the ninth chapter. Those are the prophecies that um, uh, the Buddha gives. There are uh, verses, there are inspired uh, utterances, which are called Udana. There are um, the Itu Vitaka, thus it is said, words um, that have this title that convey a particular, uh, a particular stories about um, the lives of disciples, uh, you know, the great disciples. There are Jataka tales, um, and there are wondrous phenomena tales, uh, uh, Buddha Dharma tales, stories of miracles and supernatural events. And that is certainly what's going on right here in this sutra. There are um, Vidala, um, subtle analysis teachings in a uh, cate uh, catechism form, you know, with um, looking deeper into the, into the doctrine. And, um, and then there are, there's, um, there are Nidanas, which are causes, uh, which are also, also in the suttas, avadana, noble deeds, and um, upadesa, those are instructions where we get into very esoteric doctrine. Um, this is often how the Abhidharma is des described. So the reason I went into all that is just to show that there, there are, are various kind of mini linguistic vehicles, if you will, within all of the, the three vehicles and then the great vehicles. And, um, it's, it's interesting to become aware of how the prose section and the verse section of the sutra might convey things a little bit differently. And, you know, we can be very aware of, of how we're receiving the sutra. Now, what's really interesting about the Lotus Sutra and Mahayana Sutras in general, and I'm talking about Vimila Kirti and Ava, uh, um, the Avam uh, Tasaka, the Flower Ornament Sutra, there's something that I'm, I want to talk about, I think, it, which is different from any of those. So let, let's first talk about a parable. So everyone who's been listening knows something about the Lotus Sutra knows about the parable of the burning house. Um, this is uh, an example. It's not presented as a historical or truthful fact. It's kind of um, an analogy. Right? There's no one thinks that somewhere in India there is there was this burning house um, and some rich man who owned it. It's it's a parable. Right? It's um, it's it's meant to be understood for the lesson that it conveys. And then we have what's um, considered literal in in the sutra. Um, for example, when when the Buddha um, comes into uh, Chetavatana Park and, and sits down and crosses his legs and um, starts to either expound the Dharma or answer questions, that is considered um, literal, right? Now, for someone who is a practitioner, that is a, uh, um, that is a historical event. Um, it, is, um, it is the truth which um, may or may not actually fit into historic historicity, and I'll, I'll get into that in a little while, but it's considered literal. But then we have things, um, and can give many other examples, but I'm just going to use this one, of the tongue that, uh, of all the Buddhas that um, rises to Brahma heaven and emits light. That is not a parable, interestingly enough. That is considered to be a literal fact in the sutra. And that's a rather remarkable thing to, um, to ponder, to contemplate. And in that, um, uh, in, in, that uh, in that idea and, and to convey this sort of thing, what I'd like to do for about five, five, seven minutes, I'd like, to, like everyone to do some uh, meditation, some visualizations so that we can become a little bit closer to, to this story and, and sort of look at it on a level where it's not a story, it's really more something that we're encountering. So if everyone could get um, uh, quiet in, in a uh, meditative position, and I know everyone here is um, very aware of how to do that and how to sit, 
to sit quietly, to take a very quick inventory of your um, of your body. You know, do a, a, some, a few quick sweeps, see if anything is um, predominant in your body, if anything is bothering you. Just um, become aware and don't bother about it. Just relax places where you're tensing up. Let, let the body kind of um, sink into your seat, but still remain uh, with your posture. And if possible, your back erect and your eyes cast down. And then do the same thing for your mind. Is there anything in your mind from the past, uh, from the future, or even in the present that is somehow um, tripping you up or somehow distracting you? See if you can become aware of it and set yourself loose from, from these kind of thoughts. And now um, with your eyes open or closed, visualize an apple right in front of you. See if you can do that. You can pick your color. It can have um, some uh, moisture uh, on it as if you just took it out of a refrigerator or it has dew on it from a tree. You can contemplate for a moment on what the apple is projected just to get you in a mode of visualization. And you can see what happens if you take a bite of the apple. Now you can't take a bite of the apple with your physical mouth, but you can visualize a piece of the apple getting dislodged. And there it is, there's your perfect apple, but now there's a bite taken out of it. Now, just moving right along with the visualization, see if you can visualize the Empire State Building or the Eiffel Tower or a very, very tall building of your choice. See if you can behold the stature, the height, the different parts of the building, how it rests in the ground, how it towers into the sky. And now with your imagination, see if you can extend this building or tower, see if you can expend it, extend it right up to the moon in your mind. You can see it piercing the earth's atmosphere, rising, 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 and coming so close, almost within distance that you could step off the top and land on the moon. Just try that visualization. If it works just as a conceptualization, fine. I mean, it's, um, it, this doesn't have to be crystal clear like you're looking at a painting. It's, um, uh, it's a visualization that you can do um, as a blur or more or less sharply. Just work with it. This is what meditation is about in my, in my estimation, experimentation with the mind. And then um, we've just read about the Buddha um, and all the Buddhas extending their tongues up to Brahma heaven. See, see what you can do with that image. This is even more difficult in certain ways, and we'll get into that. But just imagine that um, you see the Buddhas seated on their lion throne and they raise their heads their heads to the heavens, and somehow the broad tongue emerges from their mouth, rises seemingly instantaneously to the Brahma heaven, and there is light given from all of their pores. And so now we're not really in, in the realm of the sutra per se, we're really in the realm of our, our own minds, our own understanding. And, and now take three deep breaths and come back to Zoom land. Okay, so 
reason I, di I did this is so that we can um, hold this image in, in our minds a little bit more firmly than we might if it was just kind of a passing image. So let, let's just say that you are an utterly true believer. You believe every single word in the, um, in the Lotus Sutra as revealed truth. You, you'd still have to deal with certain things in working with the image of the Buddha's tongue. Um, so how big would it be? Really, we, we have no parameters. Um, there are uh, descriptions in the sutra of the Buddha being seven feet tall. There's um, some of the Buddha being 14 feet tall, but there are also Buddhas that are of enormous size, miles and miles high. So how big could this tongue be? Could it be the size of the earth? We don't know. And um, you know, how could someone hold a tongue like that in their body unless it has some kind of uh, magical extension powers, right? And once again, I'm not really trying to be um, humorous about this, but if you think about it, if, if you're really visualizing this as an actual occurrence, um, there are planets and there are asteroids and there are stars. How does the, the tongue go through them, avoid them? You know, something to ponder. You know, if we're working on this in a literal way, and I don't think there's um, anything wrong with that, I just think you, you just have to look at a variety of things when you do. And then, then you have the other uh, um, kind of concern is Brahma heaven. Now you can't see Brahma heaven in a telescope. As, as far as I know, no one has ever seen it, not from the Hubble, telescope or any other telescope. And um, one thing is that, and tongues, tongues don't emit light. Um, they taste things and, and they speak. So on the other hand, um, you, you can't really discount this in a certain way. In, in Sherfu's book on um, Orthodox Chinese Buddhism, when he talks about Ma Mount Meru, which is the uh, the mountain in the center of the universe, which also hasn't been seen by astronomers. Um, Shurfu says that he doesn't dare discount it because he doesn't know everything, right? We don't know everything, so we're not entirely sure. But it's interesting to open up your mind to something like this. Um, and it's interesting that, that, um, that, that a tongue can convey that which is beyond words. And of course, you can look at this image of the, the, the tongue uh, emerging from the Buddha and, and the light as a deep, deep, deep description of the Buddha's teaching, which is, which is beyond words, beyond concepts, which is beyond, beyond measure. It, you know, nothing, um, nothing that we can relate to. It sort of bursts all limitations. And you don't even have to, in a sense, just um, rely on Buddhism for this. Here, here's a quote from a poem by Wordsworth that um, Thich Nhat Hanh mentions. We, we talked with open heart and tongue, affectionate and true, a pair of friends, though I was young, and Matthew, 72. So heart and tongue, affectionate and true, this summarizes their whole relationship. It's, um, it's not conveying particular meaning, but it's conveying a whole relationship, it, it just, just in those few words. So if you look at what the, the image and the um, both metaphor and reality, the, the, the sutric, the, the sutra-based reality of the, the tongue rising, you can see that it, the implications um, and the suggestion of it are really, really profound. And remember, um, Kumara Jiva, who actually translated the version of the sutra that we're reading, um, he vowed that, um, uh, well, he, he, that everything that he said was, was absolutely true in his teaching. And when he was cremated, um, the story goes that his tongue 
remain un, um, unharmed. So there is, there is a lot, lot going on in that image. Now let's look further. The, um, when the tongue comes back, the, um, all the Buddhas cough and they snap their fingers. And on, in one sense, you read this and you say, well, what is going on? Um, uh, but this is what, uh, really to me is pretty fascinating. The, um, uh, the cough, which in Chinese is um, uh, ching kai, right? Is considered a slight cough from a Buddha. But once again, our, um, all of our understanding proportion and, and measurement and um, what is and what isn't are, are getting kind of um, destroyed through the sutra. So I, I know that if I sneeze, um, uh, I have sneezed at times when a paper on my desk might have been ruffled a little. But um, no sneeze or cough um, has ever caused earthquakes and light to emerge. So we may look at it as something insignificant and perhaps that maybe this is the point. The Buddha is just, all the Buddhas having their tongues out for a hundred thousand years, simply cough to clear their throat. There's also a sense of expiration there. They are breathing out, they're coughing. You know, what is, what is inside the Buddha is now um, spreading throughout the world. So, um, it's not just necessarily an idle image, this, this cough. It's another way, another subtle way that we're seeing the effects of the Buddha's teachings in ways that, is, that are below and beyond our understanding. Also, the, the snap of the fingers, which is like that. This may be um, the shortest interval of time in, in the sutra. The only thing that, that, that um, comes close is perhaps when the dragon princess in chapter 12 almost instantaneously turns into a Buddha. But there are some words and um, as we know she turns into a man briefly and whatever. So it's, it's quick, but perhaps not as quick as a snap of the fingers. But how long does it take to snap your fingers? You have to raise your hands the finger comes down very slowly, makes contact, and then it has to generate pressure, enough pressure to slide off and then slap against your palm. It appears like this. But how do we know, not necessarily in my case, but in the Buddha's case, that the snap of the fingers didn't take 100,000 years or more? Because in chapter 15, after the Buddha, um, all of the bodhisattvas have emerged from the earth, um, they praise the Buddha for 50 intermediate kalpas, which is a, a, an astronomical figure of trillions and trillions of years. Um, I couldn't imagine how to um, do something like that for 10 years or one year for that matter. But they do it for 50 intermediate kalpas trillions and trillions of years, but according to the Buddha's supernatural powers or by virtue of the Buddha's supernatural powers, it seems just like an afternoon to them. So we don't really know how long that takes. And, um, and the other kind of interesting thing is that the tongues are extended for 100,000 years. And I, I'll go through the sutra again to make sure, but I don't think that there is a... Um, a time uh, that is given in the sutra uh, that is sh um, shorter than that. I, I'm, and I'm not including things in, the, in the, um, um, the second chapter where somebody just nods their head and they're on the Buddha way. That is, that's just the, be the, the beginning of something leading up to something, but this is the, in the ent uh, an entire cycle, if you will. A hundred thousand years, that is very much like a snap of a finger. So. What I think the sutra does is it shows us, and I think this is what all Buddhist teachings do in a way, they show us assumptions that we're making that we don't know that we're making. Um, you know, assumptions being our 
our understanding and our reliance on time and space, you know, these things that Kant talked about as a priori, things that seem to be features of consciousness, um, which is, would not be the Buddhist teaching. And um, it's, uh, you know, it, it's, a, it's, a, it's a continual uh, cycle. And also um, the teachings sh show us where we're blind, where we're not actually seeing what's, what's right in front of us, where we're not paying attention. And as one Pali Sutta points out that the, the cause of ignorance is not paying attention. So this is dynamically ex expanded um, in, in, in the Lotus Sutra. So now, uh, another thing now, which once again, if we didn't look closely, we might just gloss over the quakes and light. Uh, so in, in Master Sheng Yen's uh, lectures on, on the Shurangama Sutra, he talks about this kind of occurrence that happens, the um, quakes and light. Um, and he said, there's light that can be seen and that represents hopefulness. And quakes can be felt and they represent the energy of the Dharma. These two phenomena are sufficient for the Buddha to express his teaching. So remember um, uh, Bodhidharma talking about the teaching going beyond um, words and uh, phrases outside of the scriptures. Here in a scripture is, and many scriptures of course, is an example of that. Um, and so, they, they are more, um, uh, they're more um, examples of expedient means, the teaching that doesn't have to be confined to concepts. And the light from the Buddha's orna that comes from his forehead uh, and the introduction to the Lotus Sutra, uh, as I mentioned, is, is, can be seen as the, the, a, a parable um, in and of itself. And once again, transcending um, the conceptual. Master Shangyan um, continues that these forces um, do need words to um, supplement their understanding, right? That's very important. Um, you know, uh, the uh, sense and ideas, as it says in the, in the poem, Faith and Mind, are not outside of enlightenment. Um, for Buddhas on the um, first Bhumi and above, um, very high attainments, light and quakes are sufficient to convey the teaching. Um, as Shurfu explains, there are, there are many kinds of light according to the situation in hand, and one needs to only have an affinity to the Buddha's teaching to see a given quality or kind of light. When beings in many different worlds see the illumination and become aware of each other, they are reacting according to their affinities and capacity. And so Master Sheng Yen goes on to say that light can be a signal, like the clapping of boards or the ringing of bell or the snapping of fingers that announces that a teaching will ensue. This is certainly true at the beginning of the sutra when um, Manjushri explains that the great illumination is a pro uh, prelude to the teaching of the Lotus Sutra, a teaching which many people feel is not even given in the sutra. And that's sort of debatable, but um, the whole sutra is the, is the teaching, of course, of course, in my estimation. And so the light can represent wisdom and quakes can represent merits and virtue. And at the level of an ordinary sentient being, light is our ability to help others. Quakes symbolize our power to influence and motivate others. Doing good will move others. Doing bad will shock them. And of course, a great le leader, unfortunately, look at Vladimir Putin, um, can do um, great harm. And of course, others can do great good, affecting millions. Um, light radiates and affects um, the entire world. And finally, Master Sheng Yen says that this light is the true light of the Buddha's wisdom. You can, he said, walk in broad light, uh, daylight and still be in darkness without it. And, um, and then finally, the entrustment chapter. Entrustment means to commend, to leave an inheritance, to delegate to someone the responsibility of taking care, of preserving, protecting, and continuing something of great value. So in this chapter, we see the Buddha conferring on the Bodhisattvas the responsibility of preserving and teaching the wonderful Dharma of the Lotus Blossom to all beings in the innumerable um, universe. And uh, a good quote from the Sutra of 42 chapters, uh, which I think is really a good way to understand um, 
the depth of the Lotus Sutra. My Dharma is to take up the action of non-action, to practice the practice of non-practice, to attain the attainment of non-attainment. And um, this really communicates us that we should not be caught up in outer form, in concepts, you know, in, in mind-based um, uh, revelations, whatever, whatever we're just producing in our mind when we're not clear. And so we, and we should also not discriminate between non-action and action, being and acting. As the Lankavatara Sutra says, between uh, dharmas and non-dharmas, and so entrustment in, implies uh, trust and faith. Um, it's uh, transitive, you know, a passing on of the lineage and teachings, um, but it's also non-transitive, implying trust in self, trust in mind, trust in the Lotus Sutra. Not so much the words themselves, but where the sutra is coming from and pointing to. And I was just going to do a, a very quick thing about um, not mistaking um, truth for facts. And um, I, I think I'm going to cut this down a little because we're time is running out. But, um, you know, th there are the, um, the, the, the four messengers or the three messengers of, where um, in the sutra it says uh, old age, sickness and death. And um, also um, seeking seeking liberation. Uh, that's conveyed in, in a story, once again, not seeming to be a parable, of the Buddha uh, emerging from his palace and um, on different occasions seeing a um, uh, someone who's sick, um, someone who is old and a corpse, and then seeing a um, shramana, someone seeking enlightenment. So one could say, well, did this happen at a Thursday, on, on a Thursday between 9 and 10 a.m.? You know, was it on a Tuesday? Right. And, and that's not the point. You know, we're, we're looking we're looking below the surface um, and, and not not getting caught up in the words. Um, and so I think that as a takeaway from the talk, we can really look at these Bodhi, uh, the um, Bodhisattva Mahasattvas that are emerging from the earth, you know, contrasting them with the Bodhisattvas that have come from outside. Um, this is our, I believe, is our true nature. You know, there is this teaching um, of Jiriki, Tariki in Japanese, and I guess it is um, Tsuli and um, Tali in Chinese, self power, other power. And uh, of course, in Chan, we wouldn't necessarily distinguish between these things, but in the way that the um, the sutra is conveying these things, uh, the the um, the emergence of the bodhisattvas from the earth. This is really, to, to my mind, the emerging of our Buddha nature. This is what we're encountering when we when we read and um, try to understand the sutra. So, I think I think that's a um, a good note to stop on where um, we have uh, uh, found a way to um, encounter and cultivate our Buddha nature and how we can share the Dharma and um, be with one another. And I um, really want to uh, thank everyone for listening. And I want to um, just give the, um, the, the final uh, ending of liturgy. Let me scroll up. So. Um, may uh, the virtuous merits adorn and purify the pure land of the Buddhas. Upwardly, we repay the four layers of gratitude. Downwardly, we alleviate the suffering of the three destinies. May those who see and hear the Dharma generate Bodhi mind. Exhausting this body of retribution, may we be born in the land of extreme bliss. So thank you all. Thank you. Thank you, Harry. Um, so we still have, I think it's about the time, but if anyone have questions, um, feel free to raise your hand. We can unmute um, and you can feel free to ask a question. Let me see. I see. I'm, I'm looking at what people put in the chats, just in case there was a question. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah, please. Anybody, any, any comments or questions? Um, 
Uh, any, any bodhisattva mahasattvas are welcome to um, unmute. <laughs> oh, Michael, hi. Hi, Michael, you can unmute. Oh, um, I guess a co-host can help you, let me see. Okay. Yeah, yeah, so, yeah, it works now. Okay. Thank you, thank you. Uh, sorry, I want to ask one question, uh, a simple question. Just at uh, chapter 25, um, for Chinese, uh, I'm, I'm from Taiwan, just uh, uh, Chinese, oh, oh, we love this this one, just the Guan, Guan Yin, Guan yeah. Yin, uh, Guan Xin, uh, Bodhisattva, Pu Men Ping. Okay. Uh, and it's very popular. And uh, Sifu say it's also um, one of the master of a uh, Guan Yin master. So I, I'm a little um, uh, wonder. Just uh, uh, he said, he said, just uh, if you have some suffering of uh, you, uh, if you have some suffering or very, very dangerous uh, situation, and the Guan Yin Bodhisattva uh, will help you or rescue. Uh, rescue you. Uh, I, I'm wonder is is it real or maybe it's a, a kind of uh, your your mind your mind affection. For example, if you are going to die and somebody uh, just uh, take you to the jail uh, to the jail and he won't kill you, uh, maybe you will be die. <laughs> maybe you, finally you are die, but your your mind maybe get a liberation. <laughs> Uh, from from the suffering, uh, is it two kind? One is real, and one is the, the uh, election from your mind. So, how do you think about it, Harry? Well, uh, th thank you, Michael. Um, that you know, that's the sixty-four thousand dollar question. I mean, that's a big question, right? And people um, approach the sutra in all sorts of different ways. There are people who utterly are devoted to it, who recite it. Um, Numerous times during the day, there was one Japanese master who recited the sutra thousands and thousands of times. And there are people who do obeisance to it and have utter faith in it. They, they might have a different opinion than, than you and me, I think. But your, your understanding of it is pretty much where my understanding is. Um, and this is something when I get to that chapter, I'll go into it in, in more detail. And it is something that's a big question to me. One thing I think you can really get out of this is not to be blinded by the supernatural in, in, in the sutra. That's sort of what I, and when I say supernatural, not just things from other planets or whatever, but some, uh, this idea that you are invincible, right? Your body, your body is going to last forever. You're never going to get sick, right? Um, and there, there are passages in, in, the, in the sutra like that. I, I think you have to look at it all from the point of mind is, the, is really the safest way. J just as you said, um, is, you know, because who, who would ever um, tell somebody, yeah, just um, jump off a mountain and, and Guan Yin will catch you, right? I, I think that's irresponsible, right? But that doesn't mean that the, that the sutra isn't true. It, it's, it's, it's finding, as I said, the lead. In, in the sutra, the, the deepest meaning, and um, and ultimately sort of be, becoming Guan Yin ourselves, you know, which is something you might do in Vajrayana practice. But this is something. So um, my uh, next talks won't be until the fall, um, but then I will be uh, I'll be dealing with um, some bodhisattvas before that, and then um, Guan Yin. So thank you, Michael. Okay, uh, Echo, please. Thank you so much. Echo, you got to un unmute. Yeah. Oh, there you okay. Go. okay, you can. Hi. Um, yeah, I, it's just coincidence that uh, the previous talks uh, by Guo Guang Shi actually uh, touched based on this so called supernatural power. And she oh. said very clearly supernatural power is rooted with great powerful understanding of the Dharma, which in other words, you have to truly understand and truly digest 
what what this the the, the true dharma is the principle of the dharma in, in terms of uh you know uh, uh you know this 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 so-called the principles right and then if you understand that truly and then you actually cultivate based on the understanding then this you will realize that truly the, the supernatural power is really it's not supernatural power it's just yeah. a natural yeah. thing so, I, I, so it yeah. really has to be really it, 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 she just stressed to emphasize that you have to root it with the, the buddha's teaching principle you have to understand that to be able to understand truly what the supernatural power is about I yeah, just want to share yeah. that, and I thought. Yeah, I thank thought you. That's that's, that, really that's very helpful. And also, you know, you bring up another thing: is when we ordinary sentient beings, with all of our anxieties, when we hear about um, supernatural, we sort of start rubbing our hands together and say, "Wow! If I could read other people's mind, boy, could I become rich? If I could become, you know, if I could um, make my body, you know, two hundred feet tall, nobody would mess with me." You know, it's all ego based you know, projections of, um, has nothing to do with, with, with true dharmic understanding. And I think we have to be very careful of that. And so thank you, Echo. Yeah.